His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Well, I had no idea last summer, summer of 2019, when I was planning the preaching for 2020, that when we landed on the book of Daniel, right now when we're gathered, that, that this book of Daniel, that, and, and our theme was how to stand strong, that there would be a time that probably for a few of our lives it would need more of the wisdom of Daniel than right now. And, and so we spent three weeks talking about standing strong when the world is crashing down and standing strong when things look impossible. And standing strong when our faith is being tested and the world is saying, bow down, and we're saying, no way, I'm standing up. So we've been digging into this topic of standing strong, but now in the book of Daniel, we get to the fourth chapter, it takes a little different kind of a turn, and we're still talking about standing strong, but standing strong particularly in certain kind of battles that, that kind of come against us personally. And so we're going to talk this week about standing strong when pride is raging, when our own pride or the pride of somebody else is, is firing up, and we all face those moments of pride in ourselves and in others. And then next week, we're going to talk about stand strong when discouragement descends. And I know many of you are feeling discouraged and, and struggling right now, but how do we stand strong? It's right here in the book of Daniel. And then our last week, week six, we'll be standing strong in the spiritual battles. And Daniel chapter 7 through 12, are all about spiritual warfare and the spiritual battles and the reality that that's going on in our world and impacting us. And so we're going to dig into this issue of standing strong in the battles. And I believe that God is going to do amazing things in our hearts and our lives in these coming three weeks. Well, when we talk about standing strong when pride is raging, what do we mean by pride? Well, pride is sort of a view of ourselves that's more inflated and bigger than it should be. Self-reliance, self-aggrandizement, you know, getting a sore arm from patting ourselves on the back too often, forgetting who God is and who we are in comparison to God and elevating ourselves higher than we should be elevated. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be thankful for who God has made us or appreciate things about ourselves, but pride is saying it's all about me. Look what I've done. Look who I am. And I remember when I was in seminary, I had a buddy of mine who was just, I loved him. He was trained to be a pastor but he was like a perfect model of arrogance and pride continually. He would constantly point out how good he was and how much he could do things better than other people. And I remember in, in our preaching classes, uh, they, they would give a score from like, from like a one to a four. And he would tell me, and the highest they would ever actually give was like a 3.5. And he would say to me, I got all 3.4s. I got all 3.4s in my sermons. He came and heard me preach one time. When I was a student of theology, he came to church where I was preaching. He came up to me afterwards. He said, man, and he, and he had told me many times, I've gotten, I've gotten you know, 3.4s, 3.4s. He comes up to me and says, man, Kevin, that was a really good sermon. I'm really proud of you. Great sermon. That was probably about a 3.3. And he meant it. He was saying, you might have done good, but you know who's better than you? This guy. And then one day, this is absolutely true, one day he says to me, you know, I applied for the advanced preaching practicum. At the school we went to, it was, a large, it was actually the largest seminary in the world at the time, and they had a massive number of students, and they had preaching courses for every student who was going to become a pastor, but they would choose the students who had the highest GPAs, the highest scores in their preaching, and the most potential to be a strong preacher, and they would invite them, only invitation only, to the advanced preaching practicum, 10 students a year, personally invited, and it was 10 students with three professors, really in-depth learning around preaching. And he came to me and he said, I applied for the advanced preaching practicum, but they didn't take me. So I'm going to go talk to the head preacher who, who leads, teaches preaching in the school and tell him why I should be in that class. And I said, that doesn't seem like a very good idea to me. And he goes, oh, I want to go. Will you come with me? I said, I don't want to go with you. He said, no, come on. He, somehow he talked me into going with him. So I stood in the office of Ian Pitt Watson, the head professor of preaching, with this friend of mine explaining to this, to this wonderful, articulate English preacher, professor of preaching, explaining why he should be in the advanced preaching class. And he said, I should be in that class because I'm awesome. I'm incredible. I'm the best preacher the school has ever seen. And he just went on and on. And I'm standing there just watching this thinking, I can't believe he's saying all this and he means it. And he was offended that this, that this preaching professor didn't change his mind. 
But the professor said, you don't have the right GPA, you don't have the right attitude, and he just told him why he wasn't going to do it, and this guy was upset. And that's severe, okay? <laughs> you would agree with me, right? But all of us have those moments when we forget who we really are and who God is, and we start patting ourselves on the back too much, and we lose perspective, and God says he wants us to grow in humility and to watch out for pride. And this fourth chapter of Daniel is this reminder. The book of Daniel as a whole and this fourth chapter is a reminder that God is on the throne no matter what our eyes see, no matter what we think. God is on the throne. And if God's on the throne of heaven, guess who's not? Me or my buddy in seminary or you. God rules. God reigns. God has all the power in the universe. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4. I hope you have your Bibles open. If not, I hope you have your Bible app on your phone or on your iPad open. And I hope we can look at God's Word together. We're going to walk through chapter 4. And, and we're going to really see what I call one story with many lessons. It's one story being told here, a story about pride in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. But there's many lessons for you and I to learn. And so I'm going to walk through this. We're going to begin at verse, verse 4, chapter 4 of, of Daniel, verse 4. And we're going to begin in the section I call, Somebody Help Me. Somebody Help Me. So let's be, begin with me. Look at your Bible. Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. So Nebuchadnezzar is speaking, and he's saying, I had this dream. It troubled me. Nobody can answer the, explain the dream, so I had Daniel come in because Daniel has a gift for understanding dreams. Now, at this point in the story, the king apparently has a little bit more trust for his wise men because he isn't saying to them, tell me the dream and the interpretation like he did earlier in the book of Daniel. Now he's just saying, tell me what this dream means. The other, the other wise men and advisors come in, and they don't try to fake it. They say, king, we don't know what the dream means. It might be because the dream had some bad news in it for the king. And if they had any hint they were bringing the king bad news, they'd be terrified. Because if he got bad news, you know by now with Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't have a good temper. When he got upset, people died. And so his advisors, nobody tries to even explain what the dream means. I don't know if they don't know or they just don't want to say. But here's a first lesson. And we're going to just glean some lessons about wisdom from the word of God surrounding this topic of pride and humility. Humility, God wants us to grow in that, and pride, God wants us to avoid it. So here's lesson number one. When you can't figure something out, ask someone wise and keep asking. That's humility. And, and I love, in Nebuchadnezzar here, he deals with pride, but he, he realizes, I can't interpret this, I can't figure it out, I'm going to go to people who can help me solve this problem. In your life, in my life, when we need help with something, there, there's a humility in saying, you know what? I can't figure this out. I can't solve this. trouble in my marriage. Maybe I need a good Christian counselor. Boy, struggling this, maybe I need to talk and pray with a friend or with a pastor. Trying to figure out how to fix something. I can't do it. There's a point where you say, I can't figure this out. I, I have fr a lot of friends that are pastors here at Shoreline. There are certain things, if I need to know about something, there are certain people I would go to. Either I either go to or I would go to because I know they know more than me. And we should all say, there's people who know more than me. I'm not going to pretend I know everything. So here at Shoreline with our pastoral team, I'll give you a few examples. If I want to find out something about how a computer works or get something fixed on the computer, I contact Pastor Ben. Among our pastors, Pastor Ben, he understands computers. And he can always explain in a, usually in a few sentences what would take me hours to figure out. I need to learn to be humble and say, can you help me? If I need to know somebody in the Monterey area who's a great plumber, a great roofer, anything that needs to be done around the house at my home, if I want to get a solid Christian person who's good at what they do, I call Pastor Keith. Why? Because he knows everybody, and that for some reason, he knows. He says, well, there's these four people, and he gives me the story, and so you can contact them. And I'm not looking for a deal as much as a good, solid, trustworthy person to do some work. If I wanted to know how to skate, ice skate backwards, or check somebody hard into the glass while playing hockey... 
I would go to Pastor David because he actually at one point was looking at going into professional hockey. He's a big guy and he knows that. Ask him sometime to skate backwards for you. He could probably do it even if he wasn't on ice, but that's who I'd go to. If I want to learn how to play the bassoon, I would go to Pastor Walt because he thought about being an orchestral bassoon player and who doesn't? right? I mean, it's so common. If I want to find great fish tacos anywhere in California, I ask Pastor Dennis why. He knows where they are. And if I want to get a combat move to defend myself in a troublesome situation, I go to Pastor Sean because he taught hand-to-hand combat in the military. I, you got to know who to go to. And pride says, I can do it on my own. Humility says, help me. Someone help me. And life is so much easier when we go to the right people for help instead of trying to pretend that we have the answer for everything. Well, let's continue through the story. So now we continue into verse, chapter 4, verse 9. And, and, now, and, and now Nebuchadnezzar is telling the dream, and so far, it seems like it's a nice dream. As it starts, you go, it seems like a nice dream. Watch how the dream starts out. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of, uh, chief of magicians. That's, that's Daniel he's talking to. That's his, his, his name among the, the Babylonians is Belteshazzar. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. No mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. So he starts to tell him this dream he had. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. Oh, that sounds like a great dream. Nebuchadnezzar, what a nice dream, a beautiful tree, a massive tree. Animals are getting food, and they're sheltered. It seems like a wonderful dream. And yet there's more going on here. There's more going on here. And so what's happened is Nebuchadnezzar has come to Daniel. He's asked him for wisdom. And so now Daniel's listening as Nebuchadnezzar sort of walks him through the dream. And Daniel's listening. And, and, and again, uh, this is just you know, kind of be swept into the story and the flow of what's happening here. So now in chapter 4, verse 13, I call this things take a troubling turn. So now, now Nebuchadnezzar is telling him the dream. Giant tree full of life and it's feet, you know, feeding the earth. But look at verse 13. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called out in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots be bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Now, watch what happens here. It changes. All of a sudden, in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar is explaining to Daniel, in the dream, it shifts from being a tree to sounding like a person. Watch how how it changes. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Not it, the tree, But let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals and among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. In the ancient world, the number seven was a number of fullness in apocalyptic literature, which chapters seven through 12 of Daniel are very apocalyptic in their nature and the genre and the type of literature with images and symbolism and, and numbers. So the number seven was a fullness. So let him, uh, let him have the mind of an animal till the right amount of time, a full time has passed for him. So now Nebuchadnezzar is telling his dream to Daniel. And it starts out beautiful and wonderful and idyllic. And all of a sudden, the tree's being cut down. The branches are cut off. The animals are scattering. The birds are, it's like a bomb's gone off. And psh, they're just, just shooting to, the, to, the, to the, 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 the four points of the compass. It's just everywhere. They're gone. But now it kind of changes to be like he's talking about. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals. It seems like he's talking about a person. So, so Nebuchadnezzar is troubled. He doesn't understand what this means. And so th- this, is, this is critical to understand that in this story, there's this picture that starts out wonderful, and then it gets kind of troublesome. Here's lesson number two. And if you're writing notes down, write this down. Sometimes we get a sense of our pride and the potential consequences 
And this is sort of a lesson about pride and humility. I have a sense, it doesn't say it in the text, but I have a sense that what troubled Nebuchadnezzar as he had this dream was this tree that was beautiful and flourishing that now has been cut down. And when it talks about let him have the mind changed to the mind of an animal, I think he has, has a sense that this could be about me. I think he wants to know what the dream means, but I don't know if he totally wants to know what the dream means. But there's a sense of humility I want to know, but he also has an awareness that something's wrong, that, that maybe his pride has led him in the wrong direction. There's something stirring in his heart. Here's what I'm trying to say. There's moments for all of us where whether we have a dream or a vision or just a moment of clarity where we say, wow, my attitude here is really dangerous. My outlook's really unhealthy. My pride is taking over. When we're continuing a behavior that we know we shouldn't be in, and the Holy Spirit keeps saying, stop doing that. Stop thinking that way. Stop acting that way. Stop, stop treating people that way. And we kind of think to ourselves, well, I can get away with it. I'll never get caught. My wife will never know. My husband will never know. My kids will never know. My boss will never know. And pride comes in. But there's this moment where we, our heart kind of says, wait a minute, I should stop this. And humility tries to creep in and say, humble yourself and repent and stop doing that. But pride says, I'll never get caught. I'll be fine. I'll press on. I want to pause for a minute. And I want to invite you to ask God to speak to your heart about pride and humility in your life. Will you quiet your heart and pray with me? And if you're at home with a number of people, I encourage you to stop. If you're doing laundry right now or if you're doing something else and you're distracted, just stop right now. Everyone bow your heads and just take a quiet moment. And would you talk to God? And would you say this, oh God, if there's areas in my life where I'm living the way I shouldn't live, making bad, dangerous decisions, having patterns in my behavior and my attitudes and my mind and my heart that are ungodly and wrong. And God, you might have been speaking to me and whispering, stop now. You're going to get caught. This is going to become public. This is going to be unhealthy for you. This is going to blow up on you. And you've remained prideful and said, I'm just going to keep walking down that road. Will you ask God right now, God, show me if there's areas in my life where I'm heading down the wrong road and pride is causing me to continue when I should be stopping and getting on my knees and asking for forgiveness and turning away from it. God, speak to our hearts in this moment of silence. Where do we need to humble our hearts and turn from prideful, sinful behaviors? Take a moment between you and Jesus. Lord, hear our prayers and hear our hearts and give us the humility to turn and to repent if you've shown us an area in our life where we are dabbling and pressing down a road that's very dangerous and pride has propelled us forward, but humility needs to hit the brakes and bring us to our needs. Speak to our hearts, we pray, Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Well, let's continue on with the story in Daniel chapter 4. Look at verse 17. I call this the heart of the matter. This gets to the very center and heart of what's going on here. Look at verse 17. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. What's declared here is that God's on the throne and Nebuchadnezzar, God decides who's on the throne and he can put someone on the throne and he can take them off. So be careful. Take this warning. Be cautious. Don't keep walking the road you're walking. I think God says that to us because he loves us. Be careful. Don't keep pressing down this road when I've warned you. So God's sovereignty is expressed and celebrated. And here's a third lesson. And this is one that we all need to learn. Lesson three, God rules and reigns over my life, even if I don't like it or recognize it. There's this pride that can say, I don't want God to rule and reign over the universe or my life. But whether we like it or not, God is God. There's only one throne of heaven, and there's only one being who sits on it, and that's God Almighty. It's not you, it's not me, it's not King Nebuchadnezzar, it's not anybody else. So we have to recognize that God rules and reigns. And when I think about that, I think about family members in my own extended family, the family I grew up in, who basically who said things like, well, I don't really want to believe in God, or I don't believe in God, or I don't, know if I, I don't like the idea of a God who watches over me and knows what I'm thinking and doing, and kind of this pushing back. I don't know if I want to believe in God. 
But whether we believe in God or not, he believes in us. He knows that we're real. And we can deny it all we want, but that doesn't change the reality that God is on the throne. He rules and he reigns. So now we get to sort of the interpretation. What does this mean? Look at me at chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to know, even though I think he's concerned and doesn't, doesn't positively really wants to know, he has to know the meaning of this dream. So verse 18, this is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now Daniel, or Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. For none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Nebuchadnezzar is still polytheistic. He still believes in many different gods. But he says, but, but he doesn't understand there's just one God yet. But he says, you know, you have the spirit of God or the holy gods in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time. And his thoughts terrified him. He's getting a window into what's going on. He's not sure, but he's going, oh, this is going to be bad news for King Nebuchadnezzar. And his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. So Daniel's kind of confused, and he's kind of silent. He doesn't want to answer yet because he hasn't got it all figured out yet. And and there's something troubling him, and he's putting the pieces together. It's taking time for this this dream to make sense to Daniel. And so here's a fourth lesson about humility. Sometimes it's best to keep our mouth shut. (laughs) Want a great lesson about humility? Sometimes the wisest thing we can do is just say nothing. One of my biggest challenges since I was a little kid I was a talker out of the womb. And I get, I, my dad would say, Kevin, you just need to stop talking sometimes. And he said that lovingly. And he was right. Sometimes the wisest thing we can do is to be quiet. And so Daniel is just silent and he's not wanting to say anything and he's sorting things out. But the story goes on to the next part that I call, you are the tree. And here's the good part of the fact, Nebuchadnezzar, that you're the tree. So look with me at verse 19. Belteshazzar answered. So Daniel answers, my Lord, If only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. In other words, this is bad news and it'd be better that I was saying this about someone else, but it's going to be about you. But he's he's speaking the truth now. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top, top, top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty... You are that tree. He says, you're you're the tree, this beautiful tree. That's you. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. So Daniel says, here's the good news. You're the tree that's been this provider of protection and of sustenance for the world. That's the good news. Here's lesson five. Sometimes everything going my way can be an incubator for pride. Well, here's a lesson about pride. For Nebuchadnezzar, he was flourishing. He was doing great. And it became almost this place where pride was growing because things went so well. Man, when the cash is flowing, beware of pride. When you're getting all W's in the win-lose column, it's all win, 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 win. Nothing wrong with that, but beware that pride may come creeping in, knocking on your door. When you think your health is bulletproof, be careful. When you feel like you're walking next to Jesus and you're just living a great life and you're just being honoring to him and and you're not stumbling or falling, be careful. In those moments, pride can come knocking on the door and seeping into your heart. But then Daniel continues with the story. He says, "Let let me keep interpreting this dream for you. And so yeah, you're the tree in all of its goodness, but here, starting in verse 23, here's the bad part. You're going to be cut down. Look at verse 23. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree. And now he knows you're the tree. So cut down King Nebuchadnezzar. Cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump bound with iron and bronze. And the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground, let him be drenched with the dew of the earth. Now we know who it is. It's Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to be drenched with the dew. You're going to live outdoors. You're not going to live in palaces for a while here. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him, till the right amount of time has passed by. Judgment is coming on Nebuchadnezzar. His pride has, is going to drive him out of the land of people and into the land of animals. Lesson six. God hates pride, and he deals with it for his glory and for our good. God so hates pride and what it does to his children. He will deal with our pride in love. 
I believe that God deals with our pride and brings us to our knees before we destroy ourselves. He loves us too much to let us keep running towards a cliff, so he trips us and lets us fall before we go off the cliff. God's love stops us from running and walking in the way of pride. And then the story continues. I call this when you lose the battle with pride, it always costs you. If you, if you let pride take over, it's going to cost you and me and Nebuchadnezzar every time we do. Look with me at chapter 4, verse 24. This is the interpretation. Daniel's still explaining to him what it means. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge, here's the key, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules, when you humble yourself, when you acknowledge that. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice, and this is huge, renounce your sins by doing what is right. Humble yourself and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. It's a warning. Beware. Be careful. Don't ever say, I would never do this or that. Know your heart. Humble yourself. Man, I could fall into any sin. I could make any bad choice. Humble yourself and say, God, help me. Give me wisdom. So here's lesson number seven. God loves us enough to give warnings. God sends Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar and says, King Nebuchadnezzar, I am telling you, stop where you are now. Repent. Don't keep walking down this road. Your pride is going to kill you. You're going to be losing your kingdom and being thrown out in the fields. And so God loves us enough to warn us. Is God warning you right now? Is there something right now that God's been whispering in your heart? You better stop that. It's going to destroy your health, your family, your marriage, your job, your reputation. And God's been warning you and warning you. And and in pride, you keep saying, I can get away with it. No one's going to find out. I'm okay. Man, let this be the moment today as we're walking through Daniel chapter 4 that you hear God say, hit the brakes. Stop. God is saying, I love you. Don't keep running toward that cliff. And pride says, I'll fly when I go to the edge of the cliff. And reality says, no, you're going to hit the bottom. So sometimes God stops us because he loves us and he gives us warnings to get our attention. And I hope that you can hear that if God's speaking to you right now and take time today to bring it before the Lord and say, God, I've been heading down this road and I stop, I repent, I ask for forgiveness. I'm done with that. Get some accountability from other people, bring it into the light and confess it and start dealing with it and let God heal you. Here's lesson number eight. God is long-suffering but also has loving limits. God is incredibly patient, but he also has limits. When Nebuchadnezzar gets this warning, God doesn't judge him yet. It's 12 more months that go by. But then the judgment comes. Look with me at what I call real consequences of real sin. In Daniel 4, verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. 12 months later, a year goes by, Judgment doesn't come. I think he kind of repented. I think he probably pulled back and humbled himself a bit, but his pride took over again. 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, now watch this. This, this. this sounds like my friend back in seminary about I'm an awesome preacher. I'm amazing. I'm the best preacher ever. He said to me one time, I'm the best preacher ever. I thought, oh boy, that's trouble. But look at this. He's walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Verse 30, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Oh, he forgot the warning 12 months before. And his pride wells up and God then brings him down. Like the tree chopped down in his dream, he's brought to his knees. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is the sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately, immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. 
He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. He became like a wild animal. He lost his mind. And for a season of his life, he lost that season. God loved him. God gave him the warning and he ignored it. Here's lesson nine. It is time. Right now. For me, for you. For that area that God has been saying, it's time to stop. It's time to repent. And, and, and we've gone back to it again and again. And we've partaken one more time. And we've engaged one more time. And it's become a habit again. And we were warned before, and for 12 months we were fine, and now we're back there again. Let this be the time that God wakes you up and says, I love you too much to let you keep going down that road. And when you get caught for that thing, it's not that I don't love you, it's because I love you and I'm saving your life. But why not before that happens, why not stop on our own? Why not pray for God's power? Why not repent? Let's do that and see what God does in our lives. And then there's this change of heart. In, in Nebuchadnezzar, after time, verse 34, at the end of that time, that, that, that appropriate amount of time, whatever it was, we don't know exactly the time frame, but this fullness of time, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar speaking again, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. He turned his eyes to God and gave him glory instead of glorifying himself. And then he says of God's kingdom, his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. He got the message. I mean, look at that, look at that last verse. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Here's lesson number 10. God longs to restore us. Maybe we didn't catch ourselves or stop our sin and, and we crashed. But man, God is waiting to restore. In Jesus Christ, God loves to restore. God has all power to restore us. But we've got to turn to him humbly and ask for forgiveness and acknowledge him as Lord. Lord, that's our prayer today. Lord, we can walk through this, this fourth chapter of Daniel and we can see Nebuchadnezzar but Lord, we don't want to sit here and throw stones at Nebuchadnezzar for his pride. We want your spirit to search our hearts and search our ways and show us where pride has taken over. Show us where we're going off the rails and thinking we'll never get caught, not us. We'll be the one who gets away with it. Let us humble ourselves and turn to you. And God, then remind us of your grace and your forgiveness found in Jesus Christ alone. And God, we would dare to pray today that if we don't, repent and turn and walk away from our patterns of sin? Would you love us enough to bring us to our knees so that we don't run off a cliff and destroy our lives? Love us enough to call us back to you. We pray, Lord, that we would repent before you need to do that. But if we refuse, Lord, love us enough to humble us and bring us back to your heart. Let us fight this battle against pride that all of us deal with. Let us find the victory that comes in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. I hope you take some time to let the Spirit search your heart. I know I'm going to. And let God speak to you about things you need to bring to him and lay before him. If you want prayer, maybe, maybe you want prayer for God to search your heart. Maybe you want prayer to deal with a challenging area. Maybe you just want to celebrate a great thing that's happened in your life. Will you use the phone number or the email address provided on the screen? Let us know. We would be honored to pray with you. If you're new at Shoreline, all you got to do is use the number that says new at Shoreline and just text welcome. 
and we want to give you a great, warm, proper welcome to Shoreline Church. If you want information about anything in the life of Shoreline Church, just go to info at shoreline.church, and we will respond with all the detail we can to help you kind of know how to walk into the life of, of Shoreline and be engaged more. And then after I send you off with a word of blessing, uh, we're going to have a short video for you to watch, just getting you up to speed on what's happening in your church. Take a couple minutes, watch that video so you can know what's happening in the life of Shoreline Church. As you go from this place, understand that every single one of us, we have our Nebuchadnezzar moments, weeks, months, or years where pride takes over. May you have the courage to hear God's whispers and challenge to repent, to bring it before the Lord, and to repent, to turn, to walk away from that, and humbly say, God, you're on the throne, I'm not. Let me be humble in your sight, turn from sin, and follow Jesus. Will you do that all week long and all the days of your life? God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday as we continue in the book of Daniel.